Hi, everybody. My name is Joseph Goodman from Goodman Games. Greetings to everybody who's at Gen Con watching this in person. It's awesome to see human beings again in the flesh, not inside little squares. But for those of you on the internet who are seeing me inside a little square, greetings to you guys as well. This is being broadcast live, so it's nice to see you all both virtually and physically. So welcome back to Indianapolis. I'm really excited to be here. It's been too long, and I forgot how much fun and excitement Gen Con is. We've had one day here at the show so far, and we're all physically exhausted. My feet hurt, and it's awesome. So it's great to be back. So this seminar is called What's New with Gaming Games. We're going to briefly discuss kind of what we're working on, what projects are coming down the pike. I'm going to talk a little bit. Some of these guys are going to talk a little bit, the contributors, and we're going to hopefully clue you in on exciting things coming up, you know, coming down. So I was going to briefly recap the last two and a half years, which is not much happened. You know, uh, it's been a while since we did one of these in person. And here at Gaming Games, we kind of got occupied by a lot of things. And we didn't release as much as we would have liked during the pandemic years. But what's happening now is a lot. So we have a lot of products in the works. A lot of it is clearing some of that backlog of things that didn't quite get released in the last couple of years. And then a lot of it is starting new projects as well. So a lot of this conversation is going to be about all those new projects coming down, coming down the pike, so to speak. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the community. Um, what's been amazing about DCC from the beginning and the Gummy Games community has been just the people and the way they've taken care of each other and just supported each other, which has been you know, really enriching and, and really cool. Um, for some of us, losing access to the cons was kind of a blow at first because we were used to seeing each other at you know, GearyCon or Origins or Gen Con or whatever. But I think over the last two years, the online cons have really helped. And I feel like we did a couple, we call them Cyclops Con and a couple other online cons, and they're really cool. Um, so thanks to those of you who came and supported those online cons. We are going to keep doing at least one online con every year. So the next one's going to be called War of the Cyclops Con, and it will be next year in May. Um, and hopefully the world gets back to physical cons, and this becomes the one we do each year, in, 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 you know, in addition to all the cool physical cons. The other thing we plan to do next year is go back to the UK Games Expo. We actually had a booth there, I want to say it was 2019, um, then the pandemic hit. But as we're returning back to the US con scene, I want to also get back to some of the international cons. So we do hope to come back to the UK at the UK Games Expo next year and slowly expand back to the physical con scene all across. And there was an era where we went to more than 40 cons a year, including a lot of local cons. Coast Con down in Mississippi, which is Luzaki's local con, tons of cons across the country. And I hope to get back to that too as we get into next year and return back to the con scene. One good thing that came out of the pandemic was Twitch. Um, we tried to go online and reach people online, and it was really interesting doing that because we discovered that a lot of the people who would find us on Twitch or YouTube or other venues actually didn't have a chance to visit us at physical cons. So for those of you watching who were never able to make it to Gen Con or Gary Con or Origins, welcome. It's really cool that we found this new way to connect with everybody, and we do want to obviously stay connected to all you guys. Our Twitch channel now has an amazing number of new shows. It's really kind of incredible, so obviously if you're watching this, you know about it. If you're not watching it, check it out. Um, just the sheer volume of creativity and excitement coming out of those shows is, is really just awesome. Um, and for all the third-party creators who have created new DCC products, new MCC products over the last couple of years, whether through Kickstarter or selling on drive through whatever it may be, keep it up. It's really cool to see your creations. Here at the con, we have, a, I want to say, like 12 feet of booth space devoted to third-party products, and that's maybe 25% of what's out there. It's incredible the amount of output from that community. It's, it's really kind of amazing. Um, so speaking of creators, um, right now Zine Quest is happening on Kickstarter. That is a place where Kickstarter encourages people to create small zine-like products and release them. So there's four active DCC Kickstarters right now for some of these third-party creators. There's a fifth actually for DCC Dice that ends today. So go out and support these folks. It's awesome to see people getting their first product out there, putting it out for you know, the world to comment on. And I think that takes a lot of courage sometimes, so it's great to see that. But even speaking of creators beyond that, we at Goodman Games have been expanding quite a bit and we need to employ more writers and artists. So I think some of you may know this, but we've had opportunities for writers and artists to participate in the last year. Um, if you're an artist, you can meet our art director, Matt Hildebrandt. Actually, you can meet him right there. <laughs> but he will actually be in the Lucas Oil Stadium um, every day from 10 till noonish and sometimes as late as two um, if you want to bring by your portfolio. As a reminder here at Goodman Games, Almost all of the art we publish is physical, which means there is a, uh, you know, something was drawn on a piece of paper. It's not digital. So there's an artifact, as I call it, either a canvas or a piece of paper with paint on it. So the best suggestion for meeting that is to bring by your portfolio, which has actual art on it, which can be slightly different sometimes than bringing by something digital. Um, and if you're a writer or designer and you want to find out how to work with us, you know, we've done various projects in the past to open up submissions. Um, there's nothing active right now, but our lead directors of product development, which is Chris Doyle for 5e and Michael Curtis for DCC, are here at the show. Um, and they will be running a seminar called How to Write Even Better Adventures. Uh, that is Saturday at 6 p.m., actually in the same room. Um, if you want to come to that and then speak with them afterwards, 
Um, you know, they love sitting around reading manuscripts while people stare at them. So <laughs> feel free to swing by tomorrow and show them their manuscript, manuscript or just talk to them a little bit and get to know them a little bit. So speaking of Matt and Chris and Mike, who are these people? So I want to tell you about some of the expanding staff at Goodman Games. So we've grown a bit, which is awesome. Chris Doyle, who you'll see later on camera if you're watching on Twitch, but also right there, is our Director of Product Development for 5e. He handles all the original Adventures Reincarnated line, the fifth edition fantasy. He's actively involved in writing and designing it, as well as working with editors and other writers and so on to get it created. Michael Curtis is the Director of Product Development for DCC. Some of you know him from the many projects he's done for Gumma Games, starting with Dungeon Alphabet, Into the Chain Coffin, into a number of DCC modules, into Linkmar. And he heads up the DCC line and MCC and related products, um, actually doing some writing and development on his own, but also doing lots of development and working with editors. Matt Hildebrandt is our art director, fearlessly directing all these artists who left to their own devices would draw crazy monsters, but under his direction, they still draw crazy monsters. <laughs> we'll show you some of those later. Um, you guys know Brendan, I'm sure, who's king of the road crew and now a full-time writer for Gimme Games. Brett Brooks is our online marketing director or manager. He's actually um, probably watching this remotely, handling all the website traffic, but he does a great job of managing our online presence. Jen Brinkman is here at the show. She organized 95% um, of the Gen Con presence. She manages customer service and convention presence. Jess McDevitt, I think some of you know, handles our customer service. She's here at the show. Um, you know, John Wilson and Dieter Zimmerman, who represents us at cons. Brad McDevitt, it's a full time staff artist. Um, and then many other artists who are here as well. We have Chris Arneson, who will speak later. Doug Kovacs is here. Obviously, all the many artists who have worked with us over the years, like Stefan Pogue, Peter Mullen, um, Will McOslin, Jesse Moan, Cliff Kurowski, Chuck Whale, and Aaron, Aaron Kreter. There's an amazing number of people who contribute to make these products happen, and it's awesome to see it all happen. And of course, many great writers as well, but I don't have all their names written down. So what I'm going to talk you through right now is plans for what I'll call the core product lines. So as many of you know, on Twitch now, Mike and Chris have recurring shows where they talk through what's coming down the pike for 5e, or as Mike calls it, the mall of Mike for DCC. And these shows are once every month or two, and it'll tell you what's on the horizon for the next month or two. So I encourage you to watch these Twitch shows to get more information about the near-term releases for either 5e or, or DCC, MCC, et cetera. What I'm gonna walk you through is what I'll call the, uh, the big arcs over the next couple of years of what's coming down the pike in, in terms of big projects, and they'll give you a lot more detail in their monthly shows. So first for DCC, some of you know that DCC 100 was kickstarted just a couple months ago. That's one with the amazing spinning dungeon that was one of Harley Stroh's most amazing outputs. And that one, we're currently, a lot of art's been done. We're starting the layout process. And we're kind of leapfrogging that into number 101 and number 102, which are available here at the show, and more are coming down the pike. One project that's coming up soon is the Purple Planet, which will return. So Lena, this is poster number one in your list. Let me show you guys. This is some of the art. Actually, that is not some of the art. This <laughs> is some of the art that Doug Kovacs has done for the upcoming Purple Planet hardcover. It's an awesome image. There's actually a front cover and a back cover as well. The hardcover will collect all of the original Purple Planet box set, as well as the three additional small modules that were released, as well as some additional content was published only in Germany for the German edition, and some other stuff, and it will be amazing. So this is coming to you soon, and again, We'll get into details later on because not all this is ready for Kickstarter or distribution or whatever, but it's coming down and it will be awesome. We're working on what we variously called either the 10th anniversary set or the box set or the family edition, but essentially some version of DCC which goes beyond that basic core rulebook and goes into something that feels more like the original basic and advanced options, or I actually have a 10 year old son, something that doesn't intimidate my 10 year old son like a 500 page rulebook does. So some version of that updated book will be released in the next year or so. It won't, there will be no changes to the rules, but we have added things like luck tokens and grudge tokens and you know, all these sort of rules enhancements over the years. So we may have, I don't know what we're gonna call it, the expert set or something that pulls together some of the greatest developments in terms of incremental rules, but the core rules won't change. x -Crawl Classics is still in the works. Some of you know that the beta rules are already out there. Um, I've already talked to several people at the con who are very excited about it. But Brendan LaSalle has been working on that with all the custom x -Crawl classes and rules like Mojo and Fame and so on, and that's still coming down the pike in process. We have the DCC Horror line, which we usually release around October of each year. We have many more releases planned for that on a regular schedule, along with the Holiday line, which now includes Valentine's Day modules. So <laughs> those are a lot of fun, and there will be another one coming out next year. And then we have DCC Dying Earth, which is actually ready for the printer. Matt actually finished the printer files last week, and I'm going back and forth with the printer on the final specs. You can't get all the paper you want these days, so like sending stuff to the printer takes longer than it used to. 
But if you back the Kickstarter, you already saw this, or maybe you saw it in the files. But this is one of Doug's maps. And Elena, this is poster number six. It's hard to even process this from far away, but this is his dying earth map, which is really just kind of incredible. Um, you'll have a version of this in the backer kit, or sorry, in the uh, Kickstarter files and eventually in the backer kit, as well as a print copy. But Dying Earth has, what, like 13 or 14 covers in there. It's amazing how much art is in there um, and an amazing, amazing amount of incredible art. And uh, so Jack Vance's son, John Vance, actually owns the rights and manages the estate now. And he's had so many positive things to say about what was done by this team, led up by Mark Bruner and the content that they produce. So if you're back in that Kickstarter, know that it's going to the printer any day now when I finalize the printer quote, um, and then we'll, of course, keep you in the loop. In Dying Earth, if things go well, I would like to expand on that in the future. So we'll see as things come along, but there's a lot of room there, I think. Then we have Mutant Crawl Classics. Um, this is, you know, a continually popular line. We just sent to the printer the fourth printing of the core rulebook. So we did the third printing, I wanna say less than a year ago, and the soft cover actually sold out almost instantly, which is pretty incredible. So the fourth printing includes another hardcover edition, another soft cover edition. It also has another variant cover. This one was done by Peter Mullen. And Elena, this is called poster number two in your files. And you're welcome to come up later to see this up close because it's hard to convey, but it's this really cool double wide spread by Peter that uh, just captures all the appropriate level of weirdness and post-apocalyptic mutation that is Mutant Crawl Classics. So this is at the printer now. We'll be back in three to four months, depending on how things goes. And uh, it's just an awesome testament to how it can look. The other fun part of the next printing is, even in the regular edition, this will be on the end sheets, another, also with an amazing image by Stephen Pose. You'll see that as well. So there's really cool stuff coming down for MCC. We've also been thinking quite a bit about DCC Day next year. You know, DCC Day was launched in 2020, which was the pandemic, and had its second year in 2021, which was the pandemic. <laughs> so we had the third year this year, which was the first what I call semi-normal year for it. And now that we have a handle on how to operate it in a normal year and a little more, hopefully, predictability for next year, we have some really cool ideas about how to integrate MCC into DCC Day. So we hope to have more of that available next year. There's also lots of new adventures in the works, and Mike and his team are working on what I'd call the MCC Annual, for lack of a better word. So that'll be coming down as well. And Mike will talk more about that in the Ma and Mike show in the, the months to come. In terms of Appendix N, as you guys know, we're big fans of Appendix N, which is, you know, all those books that Gary Gygax read to help inspire D&D. We have new Lankmar releases coming out on a regular basis. We actually have DCC Lankmar num number 13. And this is poster number three, Elena, in your files. So many of you have actually seen this cover because this one's actually for sale downstairs. It just made it to the con just in the nick of time. But this is Treachery in the Beggar City. Um, it's by some guy named Michael Curtis. <laughs> and it's uh, got some cover by some guy named Doug Kovacs, but available for sale downstairs. There's more Lankmar in the works. There's also more Empire of the East in the works. So, Elena, this is poster number seven. Mrs. Saber Hangin has approved releasing our first Empire of the East adventure module. So the hunt for the Howling God is actually at the printer right now. If you're an Empire of the East fan and have the hardcover, you're gonna to wanna to pick this up as well. This one's by Julian Burnick. I feel like I always say his name wrong. Uh, but, uh, and it's got another amazing Doug cover and you'll see this one come back to the printer hopefully in a month or two, depending on how things go. And then when it comes to Appendix N, as you guys know, we like Linkmar. And Chris actually talked about on his latest uh, Coming Down the Pike show with Mike, the monsters and magic of Linkmar, which will be released with this amazing cover by uh, David Griffith. Um, and this will be a 5e release focused on Linkmar. This is pretty much a book of crunchy stuff with uh, monsters and magic and other such material, but our first foray and some of the licensed material for 5e, which I, I think will prove very popular. Fifth edition fantasy, which Chris heads up that line, will have quite a few new releases. I have a poster here, and Elena, this is number five in your list. This is the cover to number 22. So number 21 is out here at the show. Number 22 is at the printer, Caverns of the Sea Strangers. So you'll see this one come out in a couple months. This one's by Brendan. Um, and there's lots more really cool fifth edition fantasy content coming for next year. One other thing that I think will make a lot of 5e gamers happy is that Chris is working with the Roll20 team to bring a lot of our fifth edition products onto Roll20. So I think hopefully early to mid next year, you're gonna see a lot more options out there for playing our 5e adventure modules on Roll20. Um, and then what I'll call the module manual. We've done a lot of fifth edition fantasy products. Many of them have gone through multiple printings and then finally sold out. So at some point we'll probably compile some of those into some sort of hardcover. 
the first five or six, the next five or six, something like that. So look for that to come down the pike at some point. Now, original adventures reincarnated. This is one of our most popular lines. A lot of people ask questions, what's the next one? When is this one coming out? So one through six are TSR modules that are available downstairs. Number seven is the Dark Tower. So this is module, or picture number eight, Elena, in your files. So the Dark Tower was already kickstarted. This is obviously a mock-up, but many of you backed this on Kickstarter, and thank you, it went really well, and it's awesome. Number eight, as we announced, will be Caverns of Thracia, which will be, again, another classic Judges Guild module by Janelle Jackways. We actually have number nine lined up and are sort of finalizing the details of that contract, so we'll tell you more about that once it's released. But this line, the OAR line, I mean, you can tell from the title, Original Adventures Reincarnated. I think there's a lot of room for it to present a lot of really cool classic adventures converted to 5e and even DCC in the, the months and years to come. And then Tales from the Magician's Skull. And Elena, this is poster number nine. So this is our magazine of sword and sorcery fiction. The editor, Howard Andrew Jones, is actually here at the show. This is the cover to issue number nine, which has another amazing San Julian image. This one also has another Fafford and the Grey Mouser story. New fiction by Nathan Long, officially licensed by the estate. So if you're a fan of Nightmar or just great stories, make sure to check it out when it comes out. They have issues one through eight for sale downstairs. Um, so that is kind of the overview of the many projects we have in the works. I'm going to pause here for any questions from you guys. And Elena, if there's anybody on the chat who has a question or if anybody here wants to raise their hand and ask a question in person, happy to answer those before we dive into more detail. And I can just stare if nobody has a question. <laughs> All right, cool. So great. Hopefully it's super clear. There's a lot of really cool stuff coming down. And Mike's monthly show and Chris's bi-monthly show is where you can get even more information. So now I'm going to briefly talk about Dungeon Denizens, and then after I talk about it a little bit, I'm going to ask some people to come up and join me to talk more about it. So Dungeon Denizens, I think we announced this over a year ago, but it's a book of monsters, and we haven't done a whole lot of books of monsters. We've really done one book of monster, which we call Dungeon Denizens in 3rd edition, then we did another version in 4th edition, now we're doing another version for 5e and DCC. This book is awesome. So it's going to have 500 monsters for 5e, which is quite a few. Then there will also be 500 monsters for DCC, which is also quite a few. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's taken us a while to do this. So let me show you some of the covers that are in, the, in motion. We have Elena Poster 11 in your archives. So this is the cover to the DCC edition. It's evolved a little bit from what you may have seen before. This is another awesome, it's San Julian again, another really cool image. Um, yeah, and I just, I, it's just amazing. So <laughs> this is the cover to the DCC edition. This will be a really thick book because the goal is 500 monsters with about one page per monster. There will also be a 5e edition, which will have this cover. This is by David Griffith, Griffith excuse me, and obviously it has more than a 5e look to it. And each, each volume will have the same 500 monsters, but obviously with stats for different systems. <clears throat> and then what we're thinking about doing, we end up with three covers, um, which sometimes happens because we just can't help ourselves. And this is the one that Errol Otis did, which is also really awesome. So what we're leaning towards is probably doing an exclusive slipcase for the Kickstarter backers, which is the Errol Otis image, packaged around whether you bought the DCC or the 5D edition. But Dungeon Denizens will have a lot of cool stuff. It'll have 500 monsters, 250 of them come from the last 20 years or so of published Goodman Games products. So all the DCC modules, all the 3E stuff, we went through all that material, pulled out, created a new monster here, put a new monster on this level or that adventure, and converted those stats appropriately. Then another 250 new and never before published creatures are brand new created for this to kind of round out the range of challenge ratings, creature types, etc. So uh, I'm actually just going to read you part of the back cover blurb, which I really like. Chris, I think you actually wrote this, but these are good words. This collection contains not just inhabitants of dank, twisting underground passages, but includes foul beasts that hide in the dark bows of the forest, hardy creatures that wander the windswept dunes of the sandy wastes, Piscine behemoths that plunge into the watery depths of the ocean, and strange outsiders that traipse through plainer worlds, just to name a few. The book includes an assortment of aberrations, a crowd of constructs, a horde of humanoids, a multitude of monstrosities, a frenzy of fiends, a barrage of beasts, and a plethora of plant-like creatures. And it has tons of variations. So for the humanoids, for example, you also get stats for leaders, stats for spellcasters, things like that. So it's really an awesome resource, and we've spent a lot of time on it, and it's coming together very well. 
It has full page entries with all you know, new stats and new art, notes on ecology, um, you know, evocative lore, description, tactics, and countergroups, and all sorts of things. It covers challenge ratings on the 5e side from 0 to 30. All of the 5e ones are presented in the new stat block configuration. And one of the things we're doing is also providing VTT tokens for all 500 plus monsters. So we intend to have full VTT support for it. Um, it'll have appendices with summaries of the foul critters and so on. Um, and really, it's just a great resource. So what I wanted to do now is invite some of the writers and designers up to talk about their creations. So Mike and Chris and Eric and Bob, if you guys could join me and we'll talk some about this stuff. Come on up, guys. Welcome. We seem to actually have, let me scoot some of these microphones down. I think we have Mike and Bob and I can share. Here we go. Everybody got a mic? <coughs> Always. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. So, uh, Chris, why don't you introduce yourself and then we'll go down the line and introduce ourselves. Uh, hi, I'm Chris Doyle. I am the, uh, director, the director of 5E Development for Goodman Games. And I am Michael Curtis, the Director of Product Development for the DCC and Associated uh, Lines here at Goodman Games. Uh, I am uh, Eric Dom. I'm part of the... <clears throat> I'm Eric Dom. I'm part of the uh, 5E development team. I'm Bob Brinkman. I write for 5E and DCC, and I have a really loud voice. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So welcome, everybody. Now, this is a book of 500 monsters, so there's 500 things to talk about, but we thought we'd narrow it down to maybe <laughs> six or seven tonight. So I was just going to ask each of you guys to talk about your favorite monsters. Um, Chris, do you want to go first? And just, sure, I'll go first because yeah. this is actually perfect with this. So um, so when we reached out to Errol to um, create a version of the cover for this, uh, this is what we got back. And um, I actually sent him a list of monsters to draw, um, and this is what I got back. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily had anything to do with that list that I sent him. <laughs> but what was cool was I got to go look at all these, and then I statted all of these bad boys out, which was fun, but also weird, too. <laughs> um, and made them 5e versions, so they're really cool. This is the Tendrilla Dragon right here. He's kind of cool. Uh, that's a fungal colossus in the back. Um, and that little fun... Uh, with ecology, this guy and this guy, you can barely see him over here, he kind of got cut off a little bit, but they're actually, that's like a larval stage of that guy. Um, so it was, it, was, it was a blast to be able to do that, to actually take some artists from obviously a well-known artist and, and then actually kind of make them uh, playable uh, creatures. So um, I'm gonna say those are all of my favorite. <laughs> that's great. And I did probably another 200 of them. So, so there's a lot mm -hmm. swimming around up there. Awesome. Mike, tell us about your favorites. So, uh, so I got to do what is, uh, I think we'll come back. Uh, so I got to do with uh, basically kind of the same thing that, that Chris got to do is when we were when we were doing the original planning for it, we wanted to make sure that the book was kind of balanced so that we didn't want to be like, eight, you get you know, 400 giants and 100 of everything else. So we kind of broke things down to like, you know, what different types of creatures. And we weren't, we didn't have a lot of fey creatures going on originally. So I said, okay, well, let's, let's fill that niche in a little bit. So coming in from a DCC point, it wouldn't just be standard typical Fey stuff. So I said, okay, like, what if we get like Fey which are infected by like darkness and shadow? So I came up with this entire kind of subcategory we are called the Gloomborn, and they're all kind of like subterranean twisted fairies. So there's you know there's like a kind of like a treant, but he's like a mushroom, but he commands like smaller you know uh, mushroom herds to you know chase you down. And there's like there's a, a gray malkin, which is a, which is basically a, a, a fae which can turn into some sort of you know gray cat and hunt you down. Uh, there's something which I'm very proud of called the gloomicorn. So if you don't know what the gloomicorn can do, you know you can imagine it. So, uh, so yeah, so I, was, again, I got to create this entire kind of like little backstory behind these creatures and, and put them in there. And then they, although they, although they originally statted, statted up for 5e, they felt very DCC because, you know, you can take the kid out of the, you know, out of, out of the, the DCC, but you can't take the DCC out of the kid, so. Those are awesome. Cool. Eric, tell us about your favorites. Well, uh, the Hunger Haunt and the Tyrant Dragon. These were originally written for 5e and eventually converted to back to DCC. So the Hunger Haunt, uh, picture the shadowy uh, creature, incorporeal, it's got a distended stomach, it's a Hunger Haunt, it's got emaciated limbs, and writhing around its black shadowy uh, visage are mummy-like wrappings that continue to swirl around. 
And a hunger haunt is somebody who died of starvation. And uh, it has an unsatiable hunger. Uh, essentially, if you happen to be on the wrong end of a hunger haunt, uh, its arms uh, are able to reach out and kind of pull you in and its mouth opens as wide as it needs to. Not exactly like a black hole, it holds you right up here, right? It's slowly pulling you in and um, you don't want to be there. So one thing that was neat with a variant for uh, the 5e version is the curse. Um, the uh, voracious hunger uh, and also you know for the DCC version basically if you are a person who does the final blow against a hunger haunt you are cursed with voracious hunger and you have to eat 10 times as much as you uh, do normally in a day and it's up to the judge or DM to decide how eating that much affects you during the, the day if you don't eat that much you lose a point of stamina basically or constitution whichever all right so the Tyrant Dragon. Uh, this is a call out to the uh, old school T-Rex, okay? And slap some dragon wings on it. So uh, one of the fun things doing with it, uh, mechanics wise, was changing the traditional DCC exact stats for what Claw is doing all that. Uh, making it go with its monstrous limbs and its uh, tiny little arms. Uh, picture when you're going up against a Tyrant Dragon. It controls a very large area. Think uh, like Skull Island. Think Heart of Darkness, that madness as you journey through the, uh, the jungle. The uh, Tyrant Dragon demands loyalty from all of the locals that are in the area. And uh, as characters get closer and closer to encountering it, they get more and more paranoid and lose their way um, as, as they go further into that. That's awesome. Cool, thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. Bob, tell us about your favorites. Well, I'm a huge fan of the concept of like ancient enemies. And I think the only thing that's cooler than an ancient enemy is an ancient enemy that was defeated and has been forgotten about and is coming back. So the, the first of the creatures that I would talk about are the Maltad, which are known as the Blight. And they're an ancient enemy of the elves that predate any schism to, to, you know, to elves moving down into the Underdark and they, they come in from beneath and they destroy entire forests. And they have, a very, they have a hive mentality, they exhale insects and spores, and they are virtually impossible to completely be rid of. You can defeat a hive, but as long as there are spores, they always come back. And I had a lot of fun with those. And then thinking about, again, you, know, you used to have in, in first edition, right, Yengu was the demon prince of the Knolls. Well, we have Dav Kildar, the demon prince of ogres, with this burnished metal whip that screams with the wail of, of damned souls and this gigantic mouth of double rows of teeth to really kind of strike things back. And for 5e, we get to do all of the lair actions. And those are a lot of fun. They really are. They can add a lot of flavor and a lot of really cool stuff. And so trying to figure out how to take the lair action neatness and blend it into DCC without Mike saying, no, 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 those are lair actions. We don't get to do those. <laughs> was a lot of fun. And so in both cases, they, they create very visual encounters that can take a lot of strategy and a lot of thinking. You can't just rush in and win. Those are awesome. Yeah, Bob brings up a good point. Is that if anybody is concerned, it's like since this started as a fifth edition book and we turned it over to GC, it wasn't a, you know, like it wasn't a one for one, just coloring the numbers and everything. We, we, we're very, Chris and I are very much aware that we have, you know, two different customer bases and there is overlap and everything but the DC fans obviously expect something and the, the 5e fans accept something so it was more a lot of what the DCC side it was kind of converting the spirit of something rather than like a point by point conversion so you know so if you if you're a fan of DCC you're not going to be worried about lair actions or reactions and everything it, it'll all work in the game session that you're, you're used to and I should notice that there was also there's another writer in this room who contributed monsters but is somehow managed to escape this uh, this panel so you know so. Mr. Harley Strove. So. Uh, so Harley stuck in the Harley, do you want to join us? You'd love to come up here. <laughs> 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 
So yeah, so so Harley's got. So if you know Harley's work, you, you know Harley's contributed some monsters for for Five E for GCC. So it wouldn't be a monster book without Harley. There's yeah. monsters. I mean, and, and I think yeah. the really important thing to note here is. So I think we have something like twenty five or twenty six. I'm not sure exactly that where the count's going to end up with different authors that we reached out to design these monsters. So we wanted just the best ones from people. You know, we didn't want someone to do a hundred of them. You know, we wanted them give us your give us your six or seven best. So you're really you, you've heard some of the details that Eric and Bob gave you. That's what you're getting with these. And and you know, with having so many authors, trust me, it makes it harder for us to deal with that many authors. Mm. But it, ultimately, you're getting better monsters. What are you out of applying, it. Chris? So nothing, nothing at all. <laughs> so uh, so that that's the end result of it. So you know, that's it might not be something that you folks might not understand. But you when you read the monsters and see each one, you're going to be like, wow, I got to use this one at the table and oh wow I got to use this one at the table and and then you know we did that 500 times so <laughs> and like I tell everybody whenever you do anything 500 times it takes a long amount of time <laughs> and, and if, Chris, if Chris I were smarter we got more writers because <laughs> yeah we probably should have so. like maybe 250 yeah. Yeah. So maybe that would have been a nice round number yeah, yeah so maybe if you come to our seminar on Saturday night and you really like monsters maybe we'll have something to talk about yeah <laughs> Uh, you actually you bring up a good point. I mean, we've all seen monster books out there where they claim they have you know 200 monsters, and it's like a dragon, a large dragon, an extra large dragon, a gargantuan dragon, a small dragon, and, and we there's none of that in this book. It's 500 creative, evocative, imaginative creatures, yeah. each of which has a really rich story behind it, and should be a lot of fun for your players and for your DMs. Um, maybe less fun for the players because they have to fight it, but just a lot of fun at the table. That there might be more than one armadillo variant. I'll apologize for that. But. <laughs> Don't we have a no more than one armadillo variant policy? Um, we, I think we do now. So. <laughs> Ar armadillos, that one through. armadillos are the new ziggurats. That's it. <laughs> yeah, since we actually have a ziggurat, we have to lift the ziggurat <laughs> ban, I guess. So now we're going to keep talking about Dungeons Innocence, but this time with Matt Hildebrand and Chris Artisan. So if you guys can join me, please. And Matt, you'll be on poster flipping duty. I'll be your banner. <laughs> okay. You already are my banner. <laughs> <laughs> All right, welcome up, guys. Um, so. If uh, maybe Matt, you could introduce yourself, and Chris, you could introduce yourself. Sounds great. My name is Matt Hildebrand. I'm the art director for Goodman Games, and I have the um, en enviable position of commissioning awesome art from awesome artists, sort of like this guy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chris Arneson. I'm a freelance illustrator for Joseph and Goodman Games, and been doing some sketches for the Dungeon Denizens, and finally got one painted, so, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll show that one. <laughs> All right, cool. If you don't mind flipping off the back poster. Okay. Yeah, um, and Elena, this should be poster number 14, I believe, in your archives. So uh, this one is awesome. So this is one that Chris here painted. And Chris, do you want to talk to people just a little bit about it and what you like sure. about the image and so on? I can't remember much more than it's a frost tag. <laughs> um, That's an awesome frost described, tag. Described, thank you. Um, it was described as you were wearing heavy robes and stuff and uh, slightly her bluish skin with some frost patches on, which, you know, I, I couldn't really get frost patches much on to, you know, it's going to be pretty small, but yeah, I think it has a feel of maybe she's, you know, cold or frosty, you're supposed to have some bone white spiky hair, and I was going to put some trinkets hanging from the belt and stuff, but I was trying to whip it out when I got the quick rush, uh, hey, can you paint one of those? <laughs> I had a bunch sketched, and this one I thought would be fun to paint first. So yeah. did that the other week. Yep, and we have a few to show, but the um, important thing that Joseph mentioned and Chris kind of alluded to, you can see this is just an awesome figure. There's no background, because all the il illustrations in these books kind of do double duty, at least double. One is awesome illustrations for a book, and the other is the kind of supporting that VTT play. So there's gonna to be tokens made of each of these pieces of art, and we're gonna have transparent backgrounds so they kind of fit uh, easily and, and um, on any kind of a background. You know, what, whatever the, the dungeon is that this is gonna be in, it'll work there. Um, so there's a, there's a magic spot of how much detail we want and how much, how simple they need to be to work at that tiny little size, in addition to looking awesome in the, in the book itself. Yeah. Chris, tell us, how did you paint that? Was it acrylic or oils and board um, or canvas? So that was oils. Um, luckily, I had my oil paints out. I've been doing a little bit more of that. But I had uh, Arches oil paper. 
which I had never worked on before and I wanted to give it a try. So it's done about nine by 12. Um, I had the sketch, I just oh, enlarge that to the size I want, trace it onto the paper through a light table, and then I just can paint directly on the Arches oil paper, it's prepared, so that's nice. Um, it worked a little bit differently from some other surfaces I use, so I was trying to figure out how to work with it while I was doing it, but so yeah, it's painted actually about that size, uh, the original, but. And Chris, you used actual paint to paint this. Actual paint. Not a computer. At least that's what they tell me. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's not one, a of the, computer. one of the fun things about working with Chris and Doug and Brad, a lot of their artists, they work with actual paint and paint brushes. And yep. you end up with a really cool picture and it actually exists on a little piece of canvas or board or whatever it might mm -hmm, be. Mm -hmm. And you've actually got a show on our Twitch channel in the studio with Chris Arneson. Yep. If you ever want to see him draw on Twitch, it's a great show and you can see his process in action. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. If you don't mind flipping the next one, Matt. Um, so Brad wasn't able to make it tonight, but if you can tell us a little bit about, or whatever, whatever you'd like to say about Brad's art. <laughs> this is one of Brad McDevitt's pictures. Cool. Yes, it is. Um, I believe awesome. this is the child of Bugba Bills. Which, you said it right. I think Good I job. said it right. <laughs> 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 I've listened to enough of uh, the Spellburn podcast to be able to get it right. <laughs> so, um, the Bobagwabills is a patron in DCC, and I think that, you know, I, I don't know all the stats or anything like this, but but that was the inspiration for uh, the, the child of Bobagwabills. And uh, Brad was particularly attracted to this one. I said, which one should we print? And he named this one right away. So I think it was super successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that looks great. Excellent piece. Then we have one more here um, by Doug Kovacs, if we can show that one. And Elena, this is number 15 in your uh, archives. So this is a little bit different feel to this monster. And Chris, you probably can identify which golem this is. Uh, it's the Bronze Reaper. The Bronze Reaper. The Bronze Reaper. Bronze Reaper. Awesome. Um, there is, um, there's quite a selection of pieces that Doug's already done for this. It has a, a bunch more on his plate. But um, I thought this was a nice contrast to some of the other pieces that, that, that we're showing. So we included this one as well. And there's a lot more art. 497 pieces of new set. <laughs> There's a lot that works. It's been an awesome book. I've got about 15 sketched and only one colored so far, but... <laughs> you can finish the rest by Sunday, right? Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. All right. Any questions from the audience? Sorry? Oh, I should have mentioned that. Yes, the book will be full color. Yeah. It's a big project. I mean, it's been... A, I feel like we talked about this a year ago, but it, it's been in the works for a long time. Yeah. Am I right that that was one of the cover guys? Yeah, actually, David Prentice. On the 5D cover, yeah. That's what I thought. I thought, yeah. you know, I just was wondering if I caught that. Like, yeah, caught that. keen observation. Yeah. Perception yeah. score 18. Yeah. 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 So it's interesting to see two different tastes. That's what I experienced yeah. the same yeah. monster. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Cool. Well, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Chris, for joining us. Yep. This has been an awesome project. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All right, so we have talked a lot about some awesome books, a lot of awesome, a lot of awesome books. Now let's talk about dice. So Tom, if you could join me up here. Sure. Um, some of you know Goodman Games sells dice. Those dice are actually manufactured by a company called Impact Miniatures. And Tom Anders That's here me. is the owner. Welcome, Tom. Thanks. Yeah. So Tom's a dice guy. So I'm going to briefly talk about all the dice projects we have in the works and then ask Tom a little bit about himself and so on. We, you know, DCC uses the dice chain. So there's 14 dice in a typical DCC dice set. And when we started doing this, I, I've always had a fascination with dice, and you couldn't really buy a DCC dice set. You could go to one booth and find the D5, and go to another booth or mail order to find the D7, and you could cobble together this dice set, and that's where I was 10 years ago when I was designing DCC. I, I pulled together all these cool dice, but there was no way to get a dice set. So I eventually met Tom, and that's how we now have all these cool dice sets. And we've been slowly ramping over, over the years, and then the next, I want to say six to nine months, we have a ton of new die sets coming out. A lot of the, the pieces are finally clicking in a really good way. Um, we have four new sets coming out in Q4 this year. And I'm going to show the cover art to one of them. And Tom actually has the dice to show you. I, I know you there. probably won't be able to see them. If you want to come up later and see, I brought those four with me so you could see them. Yeah. And Elena, this is poster 10 in your list. This one's called the Eldritch Ruin set. And of course, I'm showing you the cover art, not the dice itself. But Tom will have the actual dice. But the Eldridge Ruin set, and like all the DCC dice tubes, it has content on the back of the label with a little more information in it. We have the Wizard Band Stellar Stowaways. We have the Supernal Star Seeds. We have the Velos Crystallized Collections. These are all ones coming in Q4. 
We have the Ion Stone dice for those of you who back the Dying Earth Kickstarter. We have the four elemental sets from the DCC 100 Kickstarter, which are Earth, Fire, Water, and Void. We have the Dark Tower dice, which are the ones that were uh, green like set with gold lettering like Mitra. And then Tom and I are working on even more for, for next year. Um, so Tom, I, I just wanted to start by asking you, how did you become such a dice guy or such a fan of dice? So one of the first things you might notice is he said, Tom from Impact Miniatures. So my company actually started as a miniatures company. But um, when I opened Impact, it was a hobby that I did on the weekends. My actual job, I was a forensic accounting computer analyst, which is a very long title for I go into companies' accounting records on their computers and I try and find if they've done things that are not right. Um, but I was also my company's statistician and I was the main statistician for a multi-thousand employee thing. Numbers were what I did all the time. And as a hobby, I assisted with game creations. Um, I actually wrote one of the editions of Blood Bowl for Games Workshop, and that was, <laughs> thanks. Um, so um, a lot of numbers, just constantly, because when you're trying to do something like rules for a game like Blood Bowl, which is odds for everything, you're calculating, and so I get into dice because I'm constantly involved with math and dice, and then the question is, especially if you've played Blood Bowl, you're basically doing iterations of one, one out of six odds. And it starts raising the question of, wouldn't it be cool if there was more odds to play with or more variations? And so I just started really getting into dice. Um, we branched out with Impact and started making some dice that would assist players with Blood Bowl. And then that led me into talking to people who design dice and going, oh, this is cool. Somebody's <laughs> making a D5. Well, I'm going to make that. And um, that's really just how I got into dice. I just started making them to assist the games that I had helped write rules for, and then just started making cool dice that I just thought no one else was making. And I remember when I came to you, I mean, you, you were able to make some of these crazy dice that were hard to get out there. So, yeah. so the story of me meeting Mr. Goodman is actually great because my, I had never heard of Dungeon Crawl Classics, but my business partner who I bought out several years ago, but at the time was in the booth with me, he played Dungeon Crawl Classics. And we, at that time, we had all the dice for DCC in our booth, some that we were making, some that I had from other companies. But players of DCC had come to our booth and realized they could actually buy an entire DCC set for the first time at our booth. And all of a sudden, my business part, I had my back turned, and I remember I was actually putting together little uh, chibi pony miniature packs, and my business partner grabs my shoulder, and he's like, Joseph Goodman is at the front of our booth. And I went, okay, what does that mean? And he's like, go, go talk to him. Whatever he wants, just go talk to him. And I'm like, all right. And that has started what was a very, very happy relationship for me. I absolutely love working with Goodman Games. Um, and so... One of the first conversations we had was, okay, these dice that you aren't making, because I was making the 5, the 7, the 14. I was making the really weird ones already just because I thought they were cool without ever having an idea that somebody was using them. I literally told my, my wife when I said, I'm going to go spend a lot of money making these dice, and it is my field of dreams. It is my belief that if I make these dice and I make them affordable, somebody will need them. And I'm glad you did that, man. Yeah. We needed that D5. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, I mean, literally, it, it sounds corny, but the, the, the dice for Goodman Games and my comp relationship with them was just a field of dreams long shot. I thought if I, that the reason companies weren't using these dice was because they were not affordably available. And so I, and I went and created them. And then the ones that we were missing, that was buying from other companies, we then talked about what's the best design like one of the things people talk about is the d3 in a dcc set is not an actual three-sided die and the problem with most actual three-sided dies on the market is they don't roll great they kind of toss them and they slide so we actually decided uh, talking to the other that we would do the roman numeral d3 in the set just so that it would have a more randomized result when you rolled it so it was those types of conversations that then led to what you now have as the dcc set and it's amazing. Um, I mean, you've actually designed and manufactured these oddball dice that for years you could only get this die from that company and this die from that company, and it was a weird thing that this guy did as a sideline and yep. you got the whole set. Yeah, actually the, the design process, so when we've made some of the weirder dice, like if you, we, we have a D21, 
And you're like, okay, so how do you design a D21? <laughs> so here's the bottom line. I have never asked if what I do here is legal because I really don't think I want to know the answer. I have a friend that works at NASA. So, Should we, this is going on the internet. It's fine, it's fine. I'm not going to name my friend at NASA. I have a friend who works at NASA who I'm like, hey, I really think a D21 would be cool. And he's like, hey, no problem. And he'll come back to me in like a week and said, hey, I had the NASA server that figures out how to send things to Mars. I told it to do 500 million calculations and come up with the most fair shape for D21. And, and here it is. <laughs> so I always tell people, they're like, is a D21 fair? To be honest, and this is the statistician in me, no. There is no way to make an odd sided shape like, then have it be 100% fair. It's not a platonic solid. However, it is as fair as NASA can make it, so that means I'm, I'm comfortable using it to game with. <laughs> unofficially endorsed by NASA. It's unofficially endorsed. I have actually used that line in my booth. I told people. I'm like, it's like, I'm like, my dice are as fair as NASA can make them, and it always gets a kind of stare, and I'm like, just trust me on this one. So. That's amazing. So how do you make new colors? I mean, you have examples here. Yes. Of, uh, maybe I'll hold these up while you talk. You okay. have some amazing examples so, here. So the... So these new colors are, so Mr. Um, Goodman came to me and it's like, okay, we want to do the ion stone. And I said, okay. Yes, yes. Um, and what we started talking back and forth is how do we make an ion stone DCC set? And the decision that I came up with and he started describing them was, well, don't do one color. Because in the actual Dying Earth novels, he describes ion stones as coming in seven colors which is a beautiful number for DCC because it's 14 divided by two. So you meant we could do each of the seven colors of ion stone from Dying Earth um, in the set. We could do each one twice. And so then it was, okay, what are the seven colors? And some of them we already had, like, uh, that we could use from colors that we had already produced, but some of them we didn't. One of them was pink and green. So um, that then starts talking like, okay, well, what's the, de what's the description was? Another was lavender. Um, with sparkles. With um, We added the sparkles to make it more, more interesting. So these two came about because we didn't have any dice for them and we needed to match up for the ion stones. Uh, and red and blue was another ion stone dice color that we didn't have one already existing for. Now, what's really great, the last one, which actually is a set I actually have now actually just fallen in love with now that I've seen it. This is the factory that I work with, and this is a happy story that has so... <laughs> the, I ordered these pink and green dice. I sent them the Pantones that I wanted. I go through, I pick out Pantones. I'm very careful. I do a whole bunch of... I sent them the Pantones. The Pantone that I picked for the pink was retired. So the factory, rather than call me looked up on the internet what that Pantone used to look like. Now, for those of you who don't know, Pantones have recipes. It's very specific. You add this much of this and this much of this, and you get that color. They looked up the color on the internet, took a picture with their phone of the screen, walked over to the Pantone book, and went, it's this one. These dice... So are like, these dice. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and they get hold of me and they're like, we made a thousand sets of these. And I went, what? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, did, did, did anyone actually check as you were making these? These made any? So I, I hate wasting products. So I get hold of Mr. Goodman and I'm like, I have a thousand sets of these, but they look kind of cool. <laughs> Can't. Do you, can we just buy them out and we'll make a, lim, a very limited edition color? Because honest to God, I asked them, no one wrote down what, what mix they used to make these. <laughs> well, they wrote it down. They just wrote down the other Pantone. Right. And, they, and no one asked. I'm like, okay, so you used a different Pantone. Which one did you use? They didn't write it down. So, so and buy it now. It's the only time you'll ever be able to use yeah. it. Yeah. And here's the other thing that makes the set really cool. Because they didn't write it down, halfway through the production, they did the process again. So some of the dice are a little more purple, some of the dice are a little more red, 
because, and I've been told that person no longer works making dice in the front. So, okay, this shouldn't happen to you. But these are a glorious mistake. And so, uh, you know, embrace the glorious mistake. They're a beautiful set of dice, actually. Um, and when I saw them, I was like, oh, those, those would be great. But it's, it's kind of the fun of, I always joke, this is why I make the dice, because I get to deal with these headaches and just email Mr. Goodman like, Okay, there's a, there's a hiccup and I'm dealing with it. So, but um, And these are the four sets that Michael Curtis is working with some of the DCC developers on, and they came up with really awesome ideas for how to uh, you know, portray these dice as Eldritch right. Ruins or Crystallized Creations or whatever yeah. and turn them into really cool concepts for dice. So it, it's a lot of fun making the colors. So, the, so when we're making colors, they kind of come in one two ways. One is... I get a description from Goodman Games of we've got an idea for this, like um, the Dark Tower. Yeah. It was, hey, we're gonna have Egyptian lion monsters fighting lizardmen. And I said, okay, G Egypt, that's when you're saying lions, I'm picturing gold. And for lizardmen, that's green. What if we made some type of swirling gold die with green numbers to be the two factions? And so it's a lot of that's discussions. The, some of the other dice is just, I'm going through the internet and it can be as easy as, one of my hobbies is I, I, um, I hybridize daylilies and it can be just as something as, oh, that's a really cool color combination and, and then trying to make dice out of that. So it's, it's a little bit of what I see in the world and then the other half is we have a task and what's the best mix we can do to get the task done. That's awesome. Now you have a Kickstarter that actually ends tonight. Tonight, tonight. 11.59 p.m. and we've already unlocked two stretch goals so we, um, you can pick up a, 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 a new set of these, and you can get a free D18 and a free D22 with your set. D18, D22, you're blowing my mind, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> and those are pretty darn fair because they're evens. Um, and uh, they won't necessarily match unless you get certain colors, like because of the production run, but those are stretch goals we've unlocked, um, and that will get it to you. We also, the, a couple of these sets are going to be very, very limited. Like I said, the, the Wizard Van set, honest to God, if you don't get it in the Kickstarter, I am guessing that that set, once I send the leftovers to Goodman Games, are going to last days. And I'm not trying to do that to hype the Kickstarter. That's a realistic, if you're a collector, that set can't be remade. We, <laughs> it's impossible. So that's going to run out really quick. Um, but... Um, so it, it ends tonight. It's running right now. It's called Unleashed Arcana. If you look for it on Kickstarter, um, like I said, there's two stretch goals already. The prices are, are reduced, so there are deals if you get more than one set, and it comes with the DCC content. And if you're one of those that like to show off to your friends, all of these, all the rewards will ship before they show up in any store. So I will make sure that all of the backers have the dice in hands to show their friends before before they go out. And that's not going to be, I'm not going to delay, Mr. It's, we have to put, like the inserts aren't done. We don't even have, so as soon as the inserts come, we're going to make all the dice. But my, di my wife is really fast and she will be able to ship four to 500 backers in the amount of time it's going to take for the dice to get to the distributor. So the, the people that back the Kickstarter, you will have them first. So back it today. Back it today. That you, this your last. Yeah, you got like five hours. <laughs> and then tomorrow, come by the dealers hall. Goodman Games is in aisle one or booth one eleven, but basically right around the corner from us is Tom's booth. Right at yeah, yeah, the first aisle there. We're, we're one twenty four, just around the corner. And it's um, fun to just check out all the cool and, dice in this booth. And when you come to our booth, um, even though a lot of people now associate Impact Miniatures with Goodman Games dice, when you come to your booth, you're going to realize where our company started. Because it's just um, one of the things that we do is we, we sell chibi, uh, chibi miniatures for role-playing games. And so you're just going to see a sea of monsters and characters and that we make to have more fun. fun uh, in what, what I've normally said is my company gives parents ways to have miniatures for their kids to get introduced to role-playing. So. That's cool. So, Tom, you're passionate about dice, and I love it. Thank you. <laughs> it's been great working with you over the years and seeing all the cool stuff you've created. And I will take one second to win. 16 years of running Impact and many more years as a game designer under multiple kind of 
this man is one of the best in the industry, if not the best. So I have loved every year I've worked with him. Thanks, Tom. Right, thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so thank you, everybody. Hopefully this is resuming the great tradition of coming to Gen Con and talking to everybody. Um, any final questions you guys may have, either on the chat, if Elena wants to read any, or any, anybody want to raise their hand, ask any questions? Yes? Just jump him at the end. <laughs> That's actually an amazing idea. Actually, to repeat it for the Twitch audience, somebody's asking for a D7 with a seven-sided symbol of Cesarcon or star of Cesarcon <laughs> on the seven face. Tom, what do you so, think? So I'm on that. Yeah. All right, so to answer the question so I can be in front of the Twitch. Um, yeah. I absolutely can do any of that. Essentially, that's the, the, the biggest hurdle, if you want to call it. It's not so much the design. Definitely can design something like that. The, the hurdle comes in the cost because um, all of, in order to get the dice made inexpensively, um, these are steel molded. And the steel mold is the, the, the upfront cross. So the question then becomes is, if you're going to make a special D7, um, you have a multi-thousand dollar steel mold that you will have to create. Actually, well, let me stop you there. Let's just say the number is we have to sell 3,000 copies to pay for the mold, or 3,000 dice, or whatever that number is. If we flip this, would the DCC audience buy that many dice to right. justify the cost of right. the mold? And in fact... We got some hands going on. Right, right. <laughs> and in <laughs> fact, I, can, I actually know the, the minimum quantity order for like a special D7 would be 5,000. Okay. They, they won't... Uh, my factory's already told me because I've talked to them about projects like this just so that I would have the answer if he ever asked um, <laughs> and they've told me yeah well we're glad to help you with that but it's 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 a 5,000 minimum order and the steel mold will probably run about this much so that is a conversation that I could have if there was ever a special edition type thing that wanted to be run for me just to run out and do it for myself so yeah, I mean, that's the, a cool idea, honestly. The, like, yeah. The other thing I don't think people are yeah. aware of, because I get this all the time, is since we make so many sets for government, Impact is myself, my wife, my oldest son, and a 10-hour-a-week part-time employee. That is the entire company that is, is handling all this. All the dice are assembled in our living room. In, an, in basically an assembly line process. So all of this is... Man, uh, it's, well, it's manufactured in China only because there are no companies in the U.S. that will make the dice. I have tried. No one wants to touch it. And the reason for that, I'll say it very quickly, is casinos. The casino dice market in the United States is so profitable, it makes no sense for any dice manufacturer to touch what I want to do. So because of that, we make the dice in China, but everything after that is done in the United States. The packaging, the inserts being put into the tubes, that's all done while, you know, I'm watching anime. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a great question i think yeah. we know the answer now which is five thousand sets <laughs> and we'll, we'll see what we could do yeah that's awesome any other questions you guys or eric yeah in my booth it's at my booth the d21 is for sale in his booth yes <laughs> so along yeah. with um one of the dice that I'm, I'm most proud of designing um this is um we sell a d36 in my booth and it's, it's the statistician in me that loves this dice because the D36, if you roll two D6s, there are 36 possible results. So oh, wow. on each face of the 36, there are pips above the number and below the number that represent the two D6s that you would have rolled. So it's not only a D36, it also mimics perfectly statistically rolling two D6s. That's cool. Yeah, that's that's one die I'm really proud of. So, so yeah, if you wanna if you wanna see, um, we actually sell all of the sides between three and twenty, and all of the evens between four and thirty. Oh, and with the twenty-one, wow. it's all the sides between three and twenty-one. So, but yeah, we have those odd ones at our booth if you wanna check them out. Um, not necessarily in set colors, but uh, you can pick them up oddball to get them. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Any Thank other you. questions you guys have? All right, okay. cool. Thank cool. you, Tom. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. So.
So that's what's new with Goodman Games. Be sure to watch on Twitch, Mauve Mike, and what's coming down the pike for 5e, and you'll hear more about the upcoming projects. The one last thing I have to remember to ask you guys, because I always forget, is please give me your Gen Con tickets so I don't get in trouble with Gen Con. <laughs> so if you don't mind coming up and throwing them on the table, and I'll turn them in after the show.